Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, hey, listen, let's do this. I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord, and I'm going to ask for uh, the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Before we go any further, I just want to remind you, listen, you don't come to hear from a man. Don't come to hear from the, the old or the young or the black, the white, the brown, or the blonde hair, the, brown, the, the black hair, the brown hair, whatever. Men have nothing to say. I, I, as a man, I got nothing to say to you, but I know that the Holy Spirit has something very important for us to learn tonight. And as we come to the church, we're, we come to get equipped by the Word of God. So I'm going to get down on my knees, and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. So as I get down on my knees, if you're able to, would you join me in standing to your feet? And let's go before the Lord in prayer. And you prepare your hearts to receive the Word as I prepare my heart to, to, to teach the Word tonight. So Father, we thank you for the opportunity, first and foremost, Lord, that we have to be here tonight. Oh Lord, we don't take it for granted that we, have, uh, that we get to come into the house of, of God and to freely worship worship you without fear of persecution, to, to worship open and honest and to lift you high in our lives. God, what a great and wonderful treasure that is. So Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we don't come to hear from a man or to hear from a woman, the old or the young, but Lord, we come into this place, into this house to hear from you. And we acknowledge that it's Jesus Christ that's the senior leader of this house, of this church. And so Lord, it's in the name of Jesus we ask your Holy Spirit would be our teacher tonight, would be our counselor, would be our helper, would show us things to come, would make the word of God alive and rich and powerful as your word is described. And Lord, we thank you that as we leave this place, Lord, that the word would be like a seed planted into good and fertile ground. The ground is our hearts, our lives, Lord, as we are prepared to hear and to receive your word. Lord, as we walk out of this place, that we would bear much fruit, that the world would see your glory through us because of the fruit that we bear from your word. So, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for our, these blessings that you've given to us, this church. Lord, we don't ask this about, upon ourselves, but, Lord, upon all the churches across the Atlanta and around the world that are teaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ on this midweek night. Lord, and thank you for all the churches across the Inland Empire, so many of them to mention. But Lord, we thank you for our denominational brothers and sisters and our non-denominational brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank you for our local churches like Harvest and Sandals in the Grove. And Lord, we thank you for the well and the way. Lord, we thank you for uh, Ecclesia and Harvest, our, our Emmanuel Baptist and, and, and Oak Valley, Abundant Living, New Creation. Lord, all the churches across the Inland Empire. Lord, we thank you that you would bless them. This week, as they gather together and hear your word, Lord, we thank you that we are all brothers and sisters, many workers working together to build your kingdom for your glory. So, Lord, to you be the praise, the glory, and the honor. Lord, we say that your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel. As I was going through my studies, as I was just reading the Bible and Getting into the Word of God, I, I tell you, there's just something that came alive to me, and it was just so amazing. I started thinking about it and studying on it and meditating on it. And I'm, I'm going to paraphrase to you a story. And if you've got your Bibles, you can, you can go to the, the book of First Samuel. And we're going to begin in First Samuel num chapter number four. Now, for the video department, don't panic. I, there's no verses that are going to go on all the way until the verses that I gave you. So they're kind of like, oh my goodness, he's starting three chapters before I gave. No, I'm going to simply paraphrase to kind of give you the background story. So tonight, the, the title of the message is Between a Rock and a Hard Place. You ever heard that phrase before, man? You're in between a rock and a hard place. You know, that kind of means that you're stuck, right? You've kinda, you, you don't have very many options. You can't go one way or you can't go the other way. Today, I want to talk about the, the title of the message is Between a Rock and a Hard Place. But we're going to look at some biblical truths looking at this. So let me give you some background. So the background starts in, in the book of 1 Samuel. The fourth chapter. Now, this is long before uh, Saul is king or King David or anything like that. There is no king yet of Israel. Yet there's a prophet that leads or a judge of Israel that leads. And at the time, the man's name is Eli. Eli has a protege. His name is Samuel. So here the Israelites are battling or are going against their, it seems to be, lifelong enemies, the Philistines. Even today we see this uh, in, in our modern day and age, the, the fight that continues between Israel and Palestine. And so here Israel and Palestine are at war, or battling against each other, and they're camped at a place that is later to be called Ebenezer. Now, I know you're thinking, Ebenezer, I know that. That's a name. That's Charles Dickens. That's Ebenezer Scrooge. Well, today we're going to look at this and, and what that means. So they're camped here at this place that will eventually be called Ebenezer. Now, they go to battle with the Philistines, the Israelites go to battle with the Philistines. And in this battle, they lose. They lose to the Philistines. They lose a, several thousand men in this battle. So they say to themselves, what is it that causes us to lose against this, this army, against the Philistines, our enemy? So they say, you know, here's the deal. Here's what we're going to do. Let's call down and let's get the Ark of the Covenant. 
the, 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 the representation of the glory of God. And if you, if you remember or recall the Ark of the Covenant, you might even think of it as a, maybe you saw that Indiana Jones movie one time or whatever it might be. The Ark of the Covenant was a great symbol. If you recall the, the, the Battle of Jericho, they walked around the city with the Ark of the Covenant and they shouted and the walls came down. It was a great representation. People feared the Ark. And so they call for the Ark of the Covenant. And they say, well, let's bring the Ark because surely with the Ark in our presence, in our possession, as we go to battle against the Philistines... Uh, they, we can't lose. And so they bring the ark and Eli's two sons bring the ark with them. And the Bible tells us previously that his two sons were corrupt. They were not following after the ways of God, that they were taking advantage of the position that they were given. Eli had kind of overlooked their, uh, their sins as the judge or the prophet of Israel. And so God had essentially condemned them and said, your lineage will end. And so here Eli's two sons, they bring the ark of the covenant against the Philistines and the Israelites. They gather together and they have this huge cry and this huge victorious cry against the Philistines. And the Philistines become intimidated as they, they, they hear this victory shout from the Israelites. And they say, oh my goodness, their, their gods have come against them or come upon their camp and surely we're going to lose. And so the Philistines begin to rally themselves. And they say, hey, listen, we got to fight like nobody's ever fought before. Just imagine the Philistine leader with his face painted half blue, half clean, white, riding around in a kilt saying they may take our lives. But no, I'm just just kidding, that's Braveheart. But the Philistines, they, they gather themselves and they say, we've got to fight these guys. And so the Philistines, they, they bring themselves up and they defeat the Israelites once again, even though they had the Ark of the Covenant in their possessions. Uh, and the Bible tells us that uh, Eli's two sons are killed in the process or in the battle. The Philistines take the Ark of the Covenant captive and they take it into their possession. First time that's happened. And, and this is great and horrible news to Israel. So the news goes back to Eli, the prophet, and the, uh, the messenger tells Eli, the prophet, the, your sons have been killed in battle. Israel has lost and the Ark of the Covenant has now been taken and is in the possession of the Philistines. Eli the prophet falls back off the rock he was sitting on and dies. He breaks his neck, the Bible says. So the lineage of Eli was cut off and Samuel, his protege, was left. And the Bible begins to tell us that, 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 that he spoke to Israel and they heard. Now, Let's go to the Philistines. The Bible begins to talk about the, 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 the Ark of the Covenant in their presence. So the Philistines take the Ark of the Covenant. They take it back to their capital city and they put it in their temple and they put it below the statue of their God. And they come the next morning and the statue or the, the statue of their idol is fallen off of its pedestal and is laying on its face before the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, well, you know, maybe, maybe there was an earthquake. Maybe something's going on. So, you know, they pick their idol and their, their statue back up and put him on there and dust him off and make sure that, you know, all the scuffs and stuff are off of his head. And they come back the next morning and the idol or the statue of their idol again is on his face before the Ark of the Covenant. This time, his head has been cut off and his hands have been removed. All right, so the Philistines start to say, wait a minute, okay, there's something about this ark that it, it, it's not good. So they, they get a little bit freaked out by this ark. So they say, you know, here's the deal. Let's send it over to that village over there. So the Philistines take the ark and they send it over to another Philistine village. There in that village, all of the men of the village are, are plagued by tumors, huge growths all over their body. Uh, old and young, the Bible says, they have plagues and rats are overtaking their city. So the, the Philistines in that village say, this is, we got to get rid of this thing. So send it over to that city. So it goes and it, and it exchanges hands within the Philistine occupation through five different villages. Finally, after the course of about seven months, the Bible tells us, the Philistines say, okay, we got to get rid of this thing because we got tumors everywhere. There are rats taking over our village. So the Philistines gather together and they get a cart. They build a cart. They put the Ark of the Covenant on the cart and they say, we got to make a sacrifice to Israel's God because Israel's God has plagued us. So they make a chest and in the chest they put five uh, golden, now this sounds, you're going to love this one, five, not golden bricks, no, five, not, not golden coins, five golden molds of tumors. How'd you like to be that guy, right? Hold still, just only sting a little bit, pour the gold on top of that, right? Five tumors of gold in the chest and then they mold five, not bricks, Five, no, 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 not, not coins, five golden rats 
and put it in the, as a sign of the, the, the cities that were plagued by God as this ark. So they said, God, here are, Israel's God, here are five tumors. Here are five rats. And they put the cart, of the, the ark of the covenant on a cart and they put it on the cows and they leave the cows alone and they say, cows, go back to Israel. I don't even want to walk it. So the cows go right towards Israel, uh, uh, Israel's grounds. And so they, the Israelis are there. And in this particular village or this particular field that belonged to a man by the name of Joshua, they, they see the cow coming with the cart and they recognize that it's the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, can you imagine being a farmer, right? And you're, just, you're just hanging out. You're just kind of plowing. You're mowing your lawn, whatever. And all of a sudden you see a cart with no driver, with two cows, and the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, we don't even have anything that you could, in, in our society, something of value like that. I mean, this is like unheard of. So they call, they bring the, the Levites who take the Ark of the Covenant and they, they store it. For 20 years, the Ark of the Covenant stays in this certain place where they, 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 keep, they, keep a, they take care of it and they, they hold on to it. 20 years later, Eli's young protege, Samuel, is now the judge over Israel, the prophet. And he commissions Israel and he says, Israel... It's time to repent of your sins. It's time to tear down all the markers that you've made to your idols. It's time to stop worshiping the gods that you started worshiping and go back to the God Almighty. And all of Israel repents and they gather to this city called Mizpah. And at Mizpah, they gather together and they begin and they, they fight again with the Philistines, the same place that they had lost 20 years previous. And that's where we pick up on the story today is they, they go to battle with the Philistines after having this loss, after having the Ark of the Covenant taken after 20 years of, of silence, so to speak. And now they go and the, the Philistines come and they make war with the, the Israelites. And the Bible tells us in the seventh chapter that the voice of God comes upon the Philistine army so that they become disoriented and they become confused. And Israel literally slaughters them, chases them out of town. And it says, and, it, and Israel slaughters the army. So they finally, after turning from their ways win this battle over the same place in the same battlefield that 20 years ago had lost and lost possession of the Ark of the Covenant. And now we find in the book of 1 Samuel, verse, uh, chapter number 7, verse number 12, it says this, after, that, after the victory, it says, Then Samuel took a stone, and he set it up between Mizpah and Shen, and called its name Ebenezer. Now, you didn't know that Ebenezer was a biblical name. You thought Ebenezer was the, the ghost story guy, right? You thought that that's the old, that's Scrooge. I didn't know that, yeah. So he calls this place Ebenezer, saying, thus far the Lord has helped us. Now the title of tonight's message, as I already gave it to you, was Between a Rock and a Hard Place. Now the really neat thing about the title is he didn't name this place Scrooge. Literally, the word Ebenezer is taken from two Hebrew words. The first Hebrew word there is Eben, which means rock. So he took the word rock and he took the word, uh, let me pronounce it, so let me write it down because I don't, I don't want to butcher the Hebrew word. He took the word Ha'ezer and that literally means help. So here, Samuel takes a rock and sets it up and builds a monument and calls it Ebenezer, which literally means rock of help, which is exactly what God is. So today, the title of the message is Between a Rock and a Hard Place, but it's not like you think where it's, I've got no place to go. It means that you're between the rock of help, God Almighty, and a hard place in your life. Because what's going to happen in each and every one of our lives is we're going to face hard things, hard decisions, things that are going to shake. Many of you guys have been there. I've been there in my life as well, where you've had things. You thought everything was great. It was sunny. The grass was green. Rain is shining. And all of a sudden, life is shaken up. And now all of a sudden, where do we go? And tonight I want to talk about between a rock and a hard place. And God is our Ebenezer, our rock of help. And today I want to talk about what we do when we're in a hard place. Where do we go? What do we do? Literally meaning rock of help. There are times in our lives when we're going to get into a hard place and we have a rock on the other side of us. That is God Almighty, Jesus Christ, on our side. So today I want to talk about when you're in a hard place in life. Some of you might say, well, Pastor Luke, amen, hallelujah, this is for me tonight, right now. Some of you say, man, Pastor Luke, I'm all right, I'm, I'm feeling good. Well, take notes. 
Because there may be a time in your life when we face a hard place, and what do we do when we're between a rock and a hard place? So today, we're going to talk about it like this. When you're in a hard place, when you're in a hard place, and we're going to give you, I'm going to give you three simple things, three quick things tonight. When you're in a hard place. Number one, when you're in a hard place, go to the rock. Now, there's a little bit of pun right there. All right, yeah, I mean, I couldn't help it. I was thinking, okay, should I reword this? Should I, should I change that? No, I'm going to keep it. Go to the rock. But let me just say something. As much as I would love for that just to mean go to the Rock Church of World Outreach Center, what I really want to say beyond all that is go to God. When you're in a hard place, number one, you got to go to God. Before all else, you know what happens is, is human nature, we like to exercise all options. Anybody like options? I am an option man. There, I, I don't know how we did this before internet shopping, before we had, you know, where you could compare, where you could go to the store and scan the barcode on your phone and find the absolute cheapest price. Thank you. I'm an option guy. And as human nature, we like options. And so what happens is, is in our time of need, in our time of hard, in our hard times, we like to exercise options. But what we've got to realize as the church, as, as those who have the option, God Almighty, is that we have got to exercise that by going to the rock, going to God. Now, and listen, you can also go to the rock, Church of World Diary Center. That's a good place to be too. Amen. Amen. But above all, going to the rock. As our first place, you know, we, as I said, we like to exercise options. Oftentimes, we try to find help. We try to find identity from other people, from in the arms of a man, in the arms of a woman, at the bottom of a bottle, through the end of a cigarette, whatever it might be. We try to find help or the ease of our pain through the hard times by seeking out what, might, what we think might help us. But when in reality, we have got to first and foremost, before we exercise any options, go to the rock. Go to God as our first and only option. Don't seek refuge in the wrong places, but search for God. In Psalms, the 18th chapter, we're going to play around in the book of Psalms for a little bit. So if you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Psalms. Psalms in the 18th chapter. Book of Psalms in the 18th chapter. What a cool verse this is. We sang it, actually, tonight. Psalms, Psalms in the 18th chapter. Verse number 2. Psalms 18, verse number 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. So as we go through a hard time in life, we have got to realize and see what God is to us and how we have got to respond to God Almighty. You see, God is not just this distant being in the sky, this, this feeling of goosebumps in a church service. God is our rock, our Ebenezer, our rock of refuge. He is our salvation, our fortress, our deliverer, our strength, our shield, the horn of our salvation, the stronghold in which we run to and the door close behind us. And we have got to, as the church, you say, Pastor, come on, there. you're already preaching to the choir. Praise God. Hallelujah. You got this. But we, as the church, have got to understand that we don't run to people for help. We don't run to the men or to the women or to the friends. Oh, church, we don't run to social media. O-M-G. To display our business for the world to see, oh, oh, nobody knows the trouble. I'm a better let all of Facebook know that I got. Stop letting Facebook know your drama and start letting God know your drama. Because he is our rock, our Ebenezer, our shield, our fortress. You know, my little boy. He, every day, I love three-year-olds. You know why I love little kids? I love, especially little boys, because it, there is never a time when you're a little boy when you don't got an owie. It's, just, it's why guys are proud. When, we're, when we grow up, we're proud of scars. You know, we're always comparing. We're like, man, I got this one. And I got, oh, man, let me, let me show you this one. Look at this surgery I got. I, it comes, my little boy, he, whenever he falls, 
Whenever he scrapes his knee, whenever he, whenever he cuts his hand or whatever it might be just the other day, Stacy and I, she's like, please don't tell the story, but you know, come on, we like transparency in the church. Stacy and I are wonderful parents. My son ran with scissors. <laughs> yeah, I know, really. I, I mean, don't write me any letters. We already know, okay? Don't let your kids run with scissors. He ran with scissors, and guess what happened? He caught himself. He, he ran into a chair with the scissors in the front of him, and they kind of went, uh, right? And just, they went, no, don't, no, don't worry about it, okay? It's not as bad as it sounds. God covered it. All right, we learned our lesson. No scissors, no running. But you know, when he cut himself, or when he, got, when he gets an owie, or when he's outside and he falls, you know what his first instinct is? He runs to mom and dad. He runs to his shelter. He runs to his safe place. He goes to that which is safe to him. And we, as the church, have got to go back to the mentality of a child to not say, well, listen, this is, can I bounce my problem off of you? Can I let you know how I feel? Well, let me vent it out to the world. But rather, instead of sharing it with everybody else around us, going to the one that can solve the problem, that is God Almighty, that is Jesus Christ, with the mentality of a child, I will run to my dad. In my time of need, when we have a hard, when we're in a hard place in life, go to the rock. Go to God. That's what he's there for. Immovable. Paul the Apostle says that his grace is sufficient for me in my time of need. I'll boast in my iniquities because his grace is made perfect in my weakness. Are you guys with me tonight? So we're talking about when you're in a hard place, number one, go to the rock. When you're in a hard place, number two, you got to stand on the rock. Stand on the rock. Now, there, there's, there's an implication here. Standing on the rock means not running, not moving. You see what happens is, 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 what happens is we go to the rock. We go to God. We say, God, oh, I need you. God, I've got problems in my life. God, there's some issues in my life. And all of a sudden, we go to the refuge of God. And what happens is things begin to get better. You know what I'm talking about. You've been there. Things begin to get better. And what happens when things begin to get better? We start stepping out from the rock. We start saying, well, you know, things are good. I'm going to go back now. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to step over here. Things, you know, it's, I see the sun shining over there. When God is saying, hey, listen, you came to me. Stay. Stand on the rock. Don't go walking out. Don't go moving around. Don't go running around as soon as everything looks better. It's amazing how we as human beings forget things. Is anybody there? Has anybody ever given something, blessed somebody, just been there for somebody? And man, it's like a couple weeks later, a couple months later, a couple years later, it's like, man, do you even remember? What? And they're thinking the same thing about you and me because we're just like that, right? We forget and we have got to learn to stand on the rock. Standing, when you stand, you know what you don't do? You don't walk, right? When you stand, you don't run. When you stand, if I, if I was to stand right here, what am I doing? I am standing. I am remaining here. We want to stay in the presence of God. Got to stay in the cleft of the rock, in the shadow of God Almighty. Listen, take time to get solid footing in your life. Oh, man, that's, that's an amazing statement right there. Listen to this. Psalms in the 46th chapter. You're there. Turn a couple pages over. Psalms in the 46th chapter. Probably, my, probably I say this like every message. Literally on Friday night, this, every, every week I say this. This is my favorite verse. And it's always a different verse. Psalms 46, chapter, chapter number 46, verse number 10. The Bible tells us, listen, to be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Okay, I'm, I'm going to just give you a couple of examples about this because we're talking about in hard times. Now, in hard times, it is incredibly hard to be still. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I got, a, I got a purple fingernail. All right, now I'll give you another open confession. We had a dog. Uh, this is a confession night, just in case you were wondering. We were watching my mother-in-law's dog, and he was in the kennel at night, and it was like 3 o'clock in the morning, and he just would not stop. And we couldn't put him outside because I got this neighbor that he somehow got a hold of my phone number. And every time the dog barks, he calls. So it's like, I can't put him outside. I can't put him in, I'm not going to put him in my room. He's downstairs in his kennel. So, you know, finally, I'm, you know, if anybody, you know what I'm talking about. You mess with my sleep long enough and the bear comes out. 
So I go downstairs. I'm about ready to let this dog know a thing or two about how I feel at 3 o'clock in the morning. So I go into the kennel, and I'm going to try to, you know, smack the dog around, tell him to show him who's boss. Well, 3 o'clock in the morning, I go to smack the dog. I miss, of course, lesson learned, don't hit dogs. Miss the dog, hit my thumb on the side of the kennel, the wire kennel, and it just ripped my thumbnail right up and off the bed of my fingernail. Hard place, okay? If you have never ripped a fingernail off its bed, that's like, I mean, girls, like, I, 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 you're like, Pastor Luke, seriously, dude, try childbirth? Okay, I get it. <laughs> but maybe this is like close behind it, okay? And I remember I was in bed, and my wife was just like, oh, poor baby, poor baby. You know what I could not do? I could not remain still. I was crying. I was rolling around. I was, oh, oh, you know, doing the dance. <laughs> when we face hard times, when we're going through pressure, it is tough for us to be still. It is tough for us to remain in a spot. Why? Because we want the quickest relief possible. That's why we spend so much money on prescription drugs. Amen? Hallelujah. Pop a pill. We're good. And God is giving us directions. He's saying, listen, go to the rock in hard times. But don't just go to the rock. Stop trying to run to the rock and say, God, I need you. Oh, I didn't hear from you. I'll go over here. But rather go to the rock and stand on the rock. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. God's exaltation comes from you and I knowing that God is in control. Isaiah, the 40th chapter, I'll just put it up on the overhead, says this, it says that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. I don't know about you, but I want to stand on that which stands forever. Because all other ground is sinking sand. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Praise God for some old hymns right there. We got to stand on the rock and not be so fickle about our lives and so, so ever-changing. We live in a busy society that tells us, go, 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 go. If you don't get the answer right now, then it's not the answer. But we've got to learn to stop and to be still and say, God, here I am at the rock and here I will stand until I hear from you. Are you guys with me today? We're talking about when you're in a hard place. When you're in a hard place, number three today. Last one. I told you I'd preach short tonight. Last one. When you're in a hard place in life, number three, you got to build on the rock. All right. It's a progression. First of all, you got to go to the rock, right? Then you got to stand on the rock. And I love this. In the United States back in the day, in, in 1862, Abraham Lincoln signed an act called the Homestead Act. Why? Because the United States had so much land available that they said if you moved out of the city, you moved out of the country, and you went and occupied 160 acres of United States land for five years, if you built a cabin, if you dwelled there for five years, you would become the owner of of that land. You and I are thinking, man, I was born in the wrong time. <laughs> Nowadays, you can get 4,000 square feet of prime real estate where you can hand your neighbor the Kleenex through the window, <laughs> and you only got to pay through the nose. <laughs> but you see, homestead, you got to homestead the presence of God. Which means that you go to the rock, you stand on the rock, and you stay on the rock so long that you homestead on that rock. And you begin to build your life upon that rock. And stop thinking about, stop letting your mind go to the worst case scenario. I don't know if anybody else is like that, but me, instantly when hard times come my way, I go to the absolutes. Does anybody ever go to the absolute? This is, the, this is how it's going to be. Oh my goodness, this is the worst case. And we allow ourselves to go there. But what we have got to do is little bit by little bit, word by word, promise by promise, stand on the word of God and build our lives on the rock, the Ebenezer, the rock or the stone of help in our lives. That is the word of God, the promises of God, Jesus Christ Almighty, the power of God in our lives so that as hard times come, we don't go away. Are you with me today? I mean, this is so, so familiar to you. Now, if you've got your Bibles, go to the book of Matthew. Matthew in the seventh chapter. Matthew 
chapter number 7. Verse number 24. Jesus gives us a little illustration. He gives us a parable here. And you're familiar with this, I'm sure. Many of you have heard this. If you haven't, cool. We're going to read it right now. Matthew, the seventh chapter, verse number 24. Jesus says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, the word of God, and does them, I'll liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Oh, I love that statement right there. Who built his house on the rock. Verse number 25 comes along and it says, The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall. Why? Because it was founded on the rock. Do you know what rains? Do you know what floods? Do you know what winds represent in our lives? Hard times. So Jesus says, he who hears these sayings of mine and builds his house, his life, we are a temple of the Holy Spirit, a house of the Spirit of God, who builds his house, his life upon the rock, the words of God, the promises of God, to not go to what our thoughts say, to not go to where our circumstances say, to not build on what the latest fad says, to not not go and to do the the latest trend or to, 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 to read what the latest psychologist says but rather to live and to build our house, our life upon the rock. What is happening is when life comes our way, hard times comes our way, we will not be shaken. Why? Because we are built upon the rock. He goes on, I don't have it on the overhead, but he says, he who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a man who builds his house on the sand. No foundation to stand on. And when the winds, the rain, and the, the floods come, his house is no longer there. Why? Because he does not have a solid foundation. Our foundation is the word of God, the promises of God. When we have hard times, we go to the rock. When we have hard times, we stand on the rock. When we have hard times, we build on the rock. Our lives are founded on the very word of God. And let me just conclude with this. Psalms in the 91st chapter, verse number 1, says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide to live, stay, and dwell under the shadow of the Almighty. My wife and I, we just got back. Uh, there, I found out that there are two types of people in the world. There are people that enjoy the outdoors, and there are people that do not enjoy the outdoors. The reason I found that is because I, I, at least I, am the type that enjoys the outdoors. So we just got back from backpacking six days in the Sierra Nevada mountains, and we went and summited on the the summit of the tallest mountain on the lower 48 states, Mount Whitney. I've got a picture of it. You can just show it, guys. That's me and my beautiful bride right here on the front row, Stacy, standing on the tallest mountain in the lower 48 uh, states, Mount Whitney, 14,500 feet. Six days it took us to get there, 50 miles away we started, and we backed them. Now, the reason I say I know that there are two types of people, because some people are like, wow, that's so cool. And other people look at us and say, why on earth would you do that? <laughs> we camped in the shadow of Mount Whitney. There, the tallest mountain in the lower 48 United States, 14,500 feet, the night before we made the summit, we camped at the very base of that, 2,000 feet below it. And as the sun came up that day, the shadow lasted and lingered well into the afternoon sky because the mountain was so tall that the shadow, cast, the mountain, the rock cast such a great shadow where we were. It wasn't until we reached the very summit of the mountain that we saw the sun for the day. And the Bible tells us that, do, that those that dwell in the presence of the Almighty, the secret place of the Almighty, will abide in the shadow of the Lord. Meaning that God, the rock of our salvation, the rock of our help, the Ebenezer of our life, God our refuge, God our rock, we will stay in the shadow, which means when hard times come, we are tucked away in the presence. We are tucked away in the protection. We have there, God, the rock to lean on, the solid ground. Nothing else can shake us. Nothing else can move us because that rock has stood the test of time. That rock has stood the test of every attack that the world could throw at it, and it is still standing and now you and I are in the presence of God as we build our house on that rock. We build our lives on the promises of God and no longer can the world shake us. 
Church, as Christians, we should not be so easily shaken by hard times. Why? Because we go to the rock. Why? Because we stand on the word of God. The rock, the one that never fades away. Heaven and earth will fade away, Jesus says, but my words will never pass away. We stand on the word of God, the rock of God, and we build our lives step by step, promise by promise, on the word of God, on the, on the, on the rock of our salvation, and we will not be shaken when hard times come. And we can set up a memorial called an Ebenezer, in our lives that says God has helped me thus far and he'll do it again and again. Did you guys get something out of the word of God tonight? Praise God. I, I got to do this before we go. I know you're, you're thinking, Pastor Luke, we already did this. I want to just ask you all to remain seated. Church isn't out yet. We're not done yet. There's some of you in this place that you missed the call. Even though we prayed the prayer, you went through the motions. And let me just love you enough and respect you enough today. You say, man, I can't believe, well, Pastor Luke, are you going to do another altar call? You've been to churches before where they take two or three offerings up. How about one that gives you another chance to, to make the right decision today? Let me love you enough and respect you enough today to tell you the truth that you can't get to heaven because you're playing games with God, because you're sitting in church, because your parents told you that you're a Christian, because you're here tonight, your attendance means something. You can't get to heaven because you're a good person. Not going to get to heaven because you volunteer because you think you're right with God, because you've re repented of, of things that you've done in the past. The only way you and I can get to heaven, the Bible says, is because we're born again. Jesus, as he discusses the subject of eternal life with a religious leader, a man by the name of Nicodemus, a man who sang to the, or who, who memorized the scriptures, sang the scriptures, gave to the poor, taught in the synagogue the word of God, the synagogue, the church of his day. You would think that Jesus would say to Nicodemus, you know what, Nicodemus, man, you've got a great reward ahead of you. But Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Listen, there are those of you in this place today that you've been playing games with God. You've been messing around with God. You've been doing things your way, doing things a little bit of uh, uh, God's way. Kind of half and half, been living lukewarm. The Bible says that if you're lukewarm, Jesus says, he better find us hot or he better find us cold. Because if he finds us lukewarm, he says, I'll vomit you from my mouth. And today, as we talked about God, our refuge, God, our rock, I have to give you the opportunity for those of you in this place to say, man, I wonder if I should have done that. Today, this is your opportunity. And Jesus says, if you're lukewarm, you'll be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. What is lukewarm? Lukewarm simply means that you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out. A little bit up, a little bit down in your relationship with God. Token prayer, occasional church attendance, doing some of your own things, some of God's things. Not wholehearted for God, you're not wholehearted against God. Listen, I love you enough, I respect you enough. Listen, I'll be a fool for you today and tell you the truth. You're not going to get to heaven because you think so. You're not going to get to heaven doing a little bit of your own thing like God's going to give you a gold star because he gave a prayer. He's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. Today I want to give you that opportunity. In a moment I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three I'm going to go three. Smack my hand on my Bible just like that. Now across this auditorium, those of you in this place that you need to make the decision, here's what I want to ask you to do. I want to ask you to do what you're going to do is you're going to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, hey, Pastor Luke, I want to do this. Pastor Luke, I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. Pastor Luke, I missed the opportunity earlier. I'm going to do it today. I'm going to stop playing games. You see, Jesus said that if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. He said, but if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. It's your decision. It's your call. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way into your life. Listen, God's not in heaven with a two by four waiting to whack you over the head for the decisions that you've made. He's not a little kid on an anthill trying to burn you up throughout your life. God is the rock of your refuge and it's time for you in this place to stop playing games with God, to start showing some reverence and respect for God and to make the decision, a wholehearted decision today, to leave your past behind and go forward by giving God all of your heart, by giving God all of your life. That's what he's after today. Born again simply means all of your heart, means all of your life. It's not about games. It's not about messing around. It's about giving God everything in your life today. He's given everything for you, Jesus Christ. Now it's time for you to give him your life. So in a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to clap my hands. If that's you in this place, if you missed your opportunity earlier today, this is your moment. Listen, you've got doctor's appointments, dentist appointments, DMV appointments in your life. This is a divine appointment between you and God to get your life right, to ensure your place with God forever and ever and ever in heaven, leaving hell behind. The decision is yours. All across this auditorium, I'm going to count to three in just a moment. Who should raise your hand? You've never done this before. In a moment, just get your hand up. If you had never raised your hands before, get your hand up. If you're not sure, I see hands already in the family. I see that hand back there. Just a moment. If you're not sure, get your hand up. When I count to three, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. In this place today, who should do this? If you've never done this before, 
This is the moment. This is your time. Pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can go forward in your relationship with God, leaving hell behind, going forever and ever and ever in heaven with God. Today, it's your day. It's your divine appointment, your choice. All across this auditorium, wherever you're at, watching on television or by, by live stream in the foyer, hearing the sound of my voice because you left early, if that's you in this place, come on. Stop playing games with God. Stop messing around with God. I love you enough to tell you the truth. There are people in this place tonight that if you don't make the decision, you are on your way to hell. And I don't want to see a single person get that. And I love you enough to be a fool, to do this, to put myself out there for you. So I'm going to count to three. If that's you in this place, in just a moment, get your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. And you can put it right back down. We'll go forward from there. All across this auditorium. Ready? From the front to the back, family rooms, wherever you're at. If that's you in this place, get ready. Pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Put it right back down. Ready? One. Two, three. Let me see your hands in this place. One hand over there. Where are you at? Let me see the hands in this place. Two, I see you right there. Three, I see you right there. Four in the family room. Five, I see you right there, my man. Six, I see you right there. Six wise people. Uh, seven, I see that hand right there. Two more in the family room, you said? Eight, nine in the family room. Ten back there. Eleven back there. Anybody else in this place today say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. I, saw, I see you, my man, waving at me. Praise God, I got you. 11 wise people. Anybody else in this place today say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. This is your moment. This is your time. God loved you enough to do this twice for you. Anybody else in this place today? Come on, it's time for you to quit playing games with God. Start going forward in your relationship with God. Anybody else? 11 wise people. Anybody else today? Well, praise God for the 11 wise people. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're all going to stand as we stand. The 11 of you that raised your hand, or the 11 of you, or the five, number 12, 13, 14, 15, that should have raised your hand. If you're in the family room, the ushers will help you grab your stuff. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come, come, come down the aisle. Meet me right here in the altar. We're going to change destinies right here, right now. If that's you, come on. This is your moment. This is your time. Come on. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Let's do this right now. Now, you guys don't get saved by raising your hand. You don't get saved by, by, like I said, it's not an abracadabra magical prayer. Just because we prayed it earlier doesn't mean that it is, you got to do it from your heart. So here's what I'm going to do. I already introduced him once today. See that guy right over there? Pastor Joel. Remember I said nothing weird goes on? The evidence is everybody came back. See, all right? So it, it's okay. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer just like we did earlier. But this time you're going to mean it. This time you're going to do it from the heart, not just out of ceremonial ritual, okay? Like I said, he's going to give you some free information. He's going to introduce you to a friend to come back and teach you some things about the ways of God so you get strong. You don't go back to the life that you're walking away from, all right? So if you guys just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Joel. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you. In the name of Jesus, I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known 
in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.